Hello everyone, as you know, my name is Daniel Fernandez. I am the owner of scienceinhydroponics.com and today I am going to be talking about a very interesting topic that most of you might have wondered about that is not spoken a lot by anyone, which is carbon in hydroponics. So what do we know? which is, so the first thing is that most, most carbon in a hydroponic crop comes from CO2. So most carbon in a plant grown hydroponically comes from CO2. So what we are going to talk about today it's not about the CO2, we're not going to be talking about photosynthesis, but we're going to be talking about another point, which is can carbon come from roots? Could we add a carbon source to the roots of the plant such that the plant takes carbon significantly from the roots instead of the air? Why? Because the carbon that we get from the air is oxidized carbon. It's carbon plus four. But the carbon in carbohydrates, it's reduced carbon. So the plant needs energy to perform the transformation. If we could provide carbon in a way that is already reduced, we could save the plant the trouble and have it just build tissue with the carbon that we provide. So that would be very cool. So I am going to be talking about three types of what we call exogenous carbon, which is carbon that is not going to be created or in any way made or transported by the plant, but simply carbon that we're adding from external sources. So we're going to be talking about carbohydrates. And by this, I mean simple sugars. We're also going to be talking about amino acids particularly L-alpha amino acids, which are the ones present in living things. And we are also going to be talking a little bit about organic acids. Organic acids. So organic acids are acetic acid, citric acid, these types of acids that are produced by uh, organisms. So, let's first talk about carbs. So, the most studied carbohydrate for exogenous application is glucose. And you will find references to all the things that I'm talking about in the video description, so that you can see that I'm not making them up. So, glucose has been studied, not very extensively, but we have good studies about glucose. And the most important study that, that we have is a study where we used C14, which is radio-labeled carbon. So this is radioactive carbon that you can trace in the plant. So you had glucose that is radio-labeled with carbon-14, and then it is fed into maize plants. And then we track the carbon along the plant to see how far it made it and whether it actually made it to the plant's leaves and other tissue. What we have, what this study found is that less, per, less than 10% of these went into roots. So less than 10% of the glucose provided went into roots and less than 0.6% went into shoots. Shoots are the upper part of the plant, like the aerial part of the plant. So most of the carbohydrates never actually went into the plant and only a small amount went into the shoots. In this study, the media was kept pretty inert because um, this also generates problems, as I'm gonna explain in a little bit. So the conclusion of this study was no significant uptake. So if you feed glucose to a plant, there is no significant uptake. The other thing that studies have found is that microbial usage is 
way faster. So if you try to feed a plant a sugar and there are microbes present, these things are extremely fast at metabolizing that sugar, much, much faster than what the plant can do. The plant is pretty bad at transporting glucose or other simple sugars from into the roots and into the shoots, but if they are microbes, it's even worse. So if you feed a plant carbs, they never go into the shoots or into the roots, only a very, very small amount. If there are uh, bacteria present then or fungi present, then it won't go there because these microorganisms can metabolize it way faster than the plant can. So, carbs don't go into flowers or fruits. If you feed a plant carbs, they do not go into flowers or fruits. This is something that we know now. And if you think about the way a plant works, it is not surprising because a plant's physiology is not made, it did not evolve to transport carbon up the xylem of the plant, which is where the roots transport material. When material is transported from the roots to the leaves, it is done through the xylem of the plant, and the xylem of the plant does not transport carbohydrates. So the plant did not evolve to do this, and it is very bad at doing it because of that particular reason. So, should you ever add glucose or another sugar or carbohydrate to a nutrient solution? The answer is no, unless you want to feed some microbes there. If there is a reason for you to feed microbes in the solution, then you can feed the microbes with sugars. Otherwise, that's a waste of carbon. Now, the second thing is amino acids. So aminos are different because we do know that plants uh, transport aminos. So amino acids do have dedicated transporters in plant cells that can be used to move amino acids through the root system. We know also that glutamate, which is usually abbreviated as GLU, is the most studied one. Why? Because you can imagine glutamate as the backbone of protein synthesis in plants and of especially of ammonium transport. So glut glutamate is used so to transport to transport ammonium as as glutamine. So glutamate gets an an amine group added to it and turn, is turned to glutamine. And then this is transported in a sort of conveyor belt where the glutamate is used to transport nitrogen from the roots of the plant to the shoots by being turned to glutamine and then being moved up the plant. So let me show you a study now. This is a study in rice. So this is rice and we have several important things here. We have here plus N, and this is a plant that was fed normal nitrogen, so nitrate plus ammonium. We have minus N, which is a plant that wasn't fed any nitrogen, either ammonium or nitrate or aminos or anything. And then we have plants that were only fed glutamate in various different concentrations, from 0.1 to 10 millimolar. What you can see is that the plant can actually use glutamate to generate uh, its uh, tissue up to a point. So it does use it to transport nitrogen effectively up to a point, which means that it does use the carbon and the nitrogen and it does contribute. So we can replace nitrogen transport from nitrate or ammonium by using pure, pure glutamate to an extent, up to one millimolar of glutamate. After that, then the effect is negative. You can see the same sort of behavior here. You can see that the best results are achieved when we have normal nitrogen feeding. And then we can recover some of the shoot size up until one millimolar and then we go down. 
and the same thing we can see for the root system. The root size, the size of the root system is maximum at the almost the lowest concentration of glutamate, 0.5, and then it goes downhill from there. So you can see that while glutamate can replace some of the nitrogen transport, it cannot replace the entire nitrogen transport of the plant. And the more glutamate we add, the bigger, so the effect is not bigger by adding significantly more glutamate, it actually goes down if we add too much of it. Now, another interesting thing is that we can add these amino acids not to the roots of the plant, but we could also add it to the shoots of the plant. So in this study in strawberries, so this is a study in strawberries that are grown under heat stress conditions. So strawberries under heat. They were fed foliarly. So we have water only was sprayed on the plants and then two amino acids, either high hydroxyproline or glutamate. So we have here the glutamate treatments and you can see here, for example, there is a huge difference in LEDs from the plant here at like something like 11 to here closer to 21. So we have almost double the amount of yield per plant. Think about this, we are feeding 100 to maybe 300 ppms of glutamate in these studies and we are obtaining an increase in plant yield that is way more than the mass of glutamate that we are adding which means that the effect is not from adding carbon to the plant so we are not replacing photosynthesis but we are affecting the plant metabolically so this means that while glutamate does not necessarily increase the amount of carbon in the plant significantly. It might have some, some signaling effect. And this is important because these amino acids, while they might not contribute significantly to the carbon in the plant, they might actually signal to change the plant's carbon partitioning significantly in some way. For example, to spend more carbon in uh, fruits versus leaves. So they are unlikely, unlikely to be a large source of carbon. You cannot replace photosynthesis with amino acids or even supplement it significantly. By feeding amino acids, uh, you won't achieve that. And if you think about how plants work again, you will, this makes more sense because the plant was not built to uptake amino acids from the soil and incorporate them into tissue. Amino acids, especially glutamate, are more of, um, are meant to transport nitrogen from roots to the, to the leaves. So the plants did evolve this glutamate like conveyor belt to transport ammonium from the roots to the leaves, but it did not evolve to keep the glutamate. So it is true that under some conditions, if you have a plant that doesn't have any nitrate or any ammonium, but only has amino acids, that the plant can adapt to use them in an extent, but not uh, as a source of carbon, but more as a source of nitrogen. Um, you will also see that the effects, if you fed effect of aminos plus nitrate plus ammonium, this is not additive. So the plant prefers nitrate and it will aggressively uptake ammonium if it has it, but if you feed the three, it's not better than if you feed just ammonium and nitrate. So the plant does prefer these two and it will not uptake aminos aggressively if it has these two available. It's likely that aminos are a source of nutrition for plants that are grown in, under circumstances where nitrate and ammonium are limited, but it is, aminos are not going to be the main source of nitrogen in any other case. We also have organic acids, which are another potential way to provide carbon to plants. So there are extensive studies about acetic acid. 
uh, using carbon-14 labeling, and we know that there is no uptake. So there is no uptake of acetic acid uh, from, a, if you put this in solution, the plants will uptake very small amounts of it, and mainly it will stay in the roots. So nothing gets to the shoots or almost nothing. Uh, most of the, of the carbon that you measure in the shoots are most likely because acetic acid from solution is decomposed by microbes and then CO2 from that decomposition gets to the shoots and gets up incorporated into leaves by regular photosynthesis. So you do see a little bit, but it can be explained in that way. Now another commonly used organic acid, citric acid. So this we know from carbon-14 studies that there is some uptake, some uptake. And the main difference is that citric acid does, citric acid does a chelate, chelate metals. So it chelates metals and through being chelated with metals, it gets uptaken as a byproduct. It's not really certain about what the ultimate fate of the citric acid is within the tissue. We don't know if it gets actually used in any way or if it's just taken along for the ride, but we know that it is uptaken. So if you have citric acid in solution, if you have citrate ions, then the plant will uptake a significant amount of them. But we do not know if these exactly contribute to carbon in the plant in a way that would replace photosynthetically generated carbon. But we have, I would say there is not enough data to know. However, what I can tell you is that if you add citric acid and citrate, it will cause an aggressive increase in pH. So wherever you add an organic acid or the it's it's uh, or its conjugate base, if you add citrate, potassium citrate, or something like that, it causes large increases in pH due to the uptake by the plant or its decomposition by microbes. So whenever you use an organic acid, if you, for example, have ever used an organic acid to set pH to lower the pH, you'll notice that it just bounces back super aggressively, and this is because of this large increase in pH that happens either due to plant uptake or due to micro processing. So overall, is there any usage of carbon in hydroponics, of organic carbon, these particular forms of carbon? Sugars will only feed microbes, sorry, they do not get into the plant. Do amino acids contribute carbon? Not in any significant way. Organic acids contribute carbon, not that we know makes any difference. So should we add them? There might be some like signaling effects that we might be interested in in the case of amino acids that might change the carbon partitioning of the plant in some way. There are also some sugars that might have signaling effects as well, although I didn't include those in the references, but similarly to aminos, they are some more exotic sugars, especially uh, pentoses and hexoses that are not glucose but more exotic ones that might have some signaling effects. So yeah, there is some usage of these things to affect the carbon partitioning of the plant, but they do not replace photosynthesis in any significant way. They do not provide you with uh, sugars in the leaves or sugars in the shoots or sugars in the flowers. So no reason to add carbon or aminos for that. They have a very limited usage and we still don't have enough information to know how exa to exactly apply them in a way that's successful. Now, if you wanna feed microbes and you wanna feed aminos so that the microbes can produce nitrate or you wanna feed them glucose so that they can produce other things you're interested in, like some hormones that bacteria produce, then sure, that is a, a way that you can use carbon. But then this applies more to organic growing than it does to a pure hydroponic setup where feeding microbes makes uh, little sense, in my opinion. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you on the next one and bye-bye.